All rise. The Court of Appeal, Division I, is now in session. Thank you, folks. Have a seat. All right, and good morning. I don't see any masks. I was going to say those who are comfortable can remove them. We're back in a time that we can actually see faces and smiles again, or grimaces, I guess, depending on the moment. We are here for oral argument in 1 CACV 20-0566, Groover et al. v. Wild Western. As you know, we do record these proceedings, and we also simulcast them, or live stream them, I guess is the correct term. So please give your name and your client's name when you begin. According to the current protocol, which is continuing, you will argue from council table rather than the podium. You have a maximum of 20 minutes. It is a maximum. You don't have to use it all. So please use your time wisely. We do require that you keep track of your own time. Now, the clock is on the podium. If you have any trouble seeing it as you're standing at your table, please feel free to move around to keep track of it. The time showing on the podium is the total time you have remaining, not the time that you have used. I'll also try to give you signposts, although I think most people are now able to see the clock and kind of gotten used to this new version. Please keep in mind we have read the briefs, we've studied the record, and we've discussed the case in conference. So we are familiar with it, and I'd encourage you not to just repeat your briefs. So counsel, if you're ready. May it please the court, my name is David Abney. I'm here today with Heather Bouchore. We represent the appellants. This is an unusual case in many ways. I've never had a horse case. But the purported release is one of the more unusual documents that I've seen in my career, because if you read it closely, it doesn't release anything. You can find the document as Exhibit C to Index of Record 30, and it says in relevant part, I assume full responsibility for personal injury or for loss or damage, except to the extent such damage or injury may be due to the negligence of, and then it lists the company. So I've got responsibility for my injuries and whatnot, except to the extent that such damage or injury may be due to the negligence of the company. It's not, I don't know what it is, but it's not releasing negligence. It's saying just the opposite. Well, Mr. Abney, maybe that's not releasing negligence, but what about the first sentence of your client's response to the motion for summary judgment? I'm afraid I have not memorized the first sentence, Your Honor. Okay. I believe it. You know what? First paragraph. We'll be safe. It says something about we're not pursuing a negligence claim. What's the significance of that? Significance of that is they should have pursued a negligence claim, and I assume that they will when we get this back down. But even for gross negligence, this release does not release gross negligence. It doesn't release negligence in any form. Right. What I'm talking about is whether there's a negligence claim in this lawsuit still. I mean, if you read that first sentence, it says everyone's talking about gross negligence. We're not pursuing negligence, a negligence claim. I don't have the language right in front of me. I think you're pretty accurate, and it sort of gave me the... What's the significance of that? Well, for this particular appeal, the significance is we take a look at the release, and we decide that the release doesn't apply. It doesn't trigger the statute, so the gross negligence standard doesn't apply. But even if gross negligence were what's going on here, there is enough with the background information plus the expert's opinion to say that there is gross negligence. Let's put the gross negligence aside. The complaint asserted primarily two claims, gross negligence and negligence. Right. Is there a negligence claim in this lawsuit still? Yes, there is. And how... What's the significance of your client disclaiming in the summary judgment practice, motion practice, the negligence claim? The significance is that they overreacted to the motion and decided just to hit the gross negligence part of it. Right, but sort of the practical ultimate significance under our rules, 
Well, I hope I don't hear a waver in, in, the, in the background flapping its wings. Uh, I, I, I think it was a question okay. rather than an answer. Oh, the, sig the significance is, uh, for this particular appeal, is that the, the discussion will, will focus a bit more on gross negligence than it should, because I believe this is indeed both a negligence and gross negligence claim and case. So uh, would you say then that there is still a negligence claim because it was after an answer had been filed and a court has to issue an order for a, a, a claim to be dismissed and there was no order, it was only a sentence in motion practice? Basically, plus if you look at what the, what the judge actually said, I don't find negligence much less gross negligence. Well, so the, the judge did decide about the negligence. I don't find any negligence here at all. Okay, so it's two answers. Number one, there's no order dismissing it. And number two, the summary judgment minute entry tackles negligence. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And anyway. Should I th add a third? Did they seek summary? They did not seek summary judgment on the, quote, negligence claim, correct? Or do you recall? I mean, did they actually specifically seek summary judgment on the negligence claim that was in the complaint? I'm going to have to use the answer that I'm always told to use. I don't know. I, I can't remember right offhand. I don't have the entire we'll file that. with me. Okay, good. I tried guessing yesterday at the Ninth Circuit. It got me in trouble. I don't guess anymore. I'm sorry. Uh, the other thing about this, this purported release is uh, they're, they're focusing on it not only to say that there's been a complete release, but also to say, well, this triggers the statute, 12.553. But if you look at the definition of release in the statute, this is not a release that fits the statute. It doesn't mention gross negligence, wanton negligence, or anything like that. So you don't get into the gross negligence standard that the statute creates to protect the equine industry. Um, they also attack uh, the expert uh, several times at, uh, at least five times in the answering brief, they attack the expert for giving opinions that talking about probably. Well, that's what good experts do. They talk about probabilities. If the expert had said possible, we'd be out the, we'd be out the door. You, you, can't, you can't get anywhere with an expert that just says possibly as far as an affirmative, trying to create an affirmative situation. And you don't want an expert that says certainty because no good expert will ever say it's certainty. I mean, if you ask an expert in astronomy if the Earth will continue to rotate and the sun will appear to rise tomorrow, he'll say mm, possibly it will, possibly it won't. We just don't know. They don't even understand what gravity is, for that matter. But uh, the expert did a good job, uh, and he's an experience-based expert. They attack the expert because there's no peer-reviewed journals dealing with how to conduct this kind of excursion uh, with a horseback excursion adventure sort of thing. Uh, and there probably and there probably isn't. I didn't find any, but I, I didn't particularly look for that kind of a of, of a peer-reviewed sort of thing. But you can have experts that give opinions based on experience. It happens all the time. Police officers are the classic example. They, they give expert-based, experience-based opinions all the time. This is one of those areas where you've got 40 to 50 years of experience dealing with this sort of situation, how you're supposed to conduct the trail rides, uh, the amount of spacing you're supposed to have, uh, so the amount Mr. of supervision. Uh, can you... If, let's say I'm writing a decision and I'm going to say it was a tribal issue on causation and here there are the facts that make it a tribal issue. Can you list those for me? Yes. In Isn't the it, record? Well, I, I mean, try. generally, we, we can find, go ahead. There's tribal issues of fact because the, uh, the people who are putting on or conducting this sort of activity were professionals experienced in it. And the expert has said, with no contradiction from any other expert, that you have to conduct these in a very specific way to prevent this specific kind of injury. You've got to have, you've got to have spacing six feet or so between the horses. You've got to maintain that. You've got to keep a close eye on everybody who was, who was working through uh, this trail ride from beginning to end. You need a ratio of wranglers to horses of one wrangler to six horses. No more the horses than that or the wrangler can't keep control and supervision. Uh, you've got to be careful at all times with the horses because horses are inherently dangerous. Uh, now, I put in that, that quote from Ian Fleming, it's a horse is an animal, dangerous at both ends and uncomfortable in the middle, uh, because it's so true. And when I read that, I just said, you know, my experience with horses is exactly that. And anybody's experience with horses, I would add as an, an additional thing that the expert will supply, 
is that horses are inherently dangerous. They, they're unpredictable. They are a fright, fight, flight, herd animal. They take fright easily. Their first, their first reaction is to, is to lash out, biting or kicking, and their last reaction is to run like the devil. And that's how they have survived as a species for millions of years. They have that sort of reaction. And it makes them very difficult to deal with. If you've been around a horse any, any length of time at all, you know, for instance, you never go behind the horse unless you have to. And if you do, you're on extreme guard because that horse could kick out at any second. And if you're in the way, goodbye. So, so, as, as, so I have number one, expert testimony. Yes. Okay. Number two, experience of the Wrangler of, soci of, of this company itself. Clearly, they have experience doing this. Okay. And then, what, what, what is there to counter it in the record? They have you're, no expert you're, testimony you're to counter. I don't think they have anything other than there's, there's snippets from the people that work there saying, well, I've never seen a horse kick one, one of, I've never seen a horse kick a rider, I think is what they said which I find astonishing. If you're around the horses for a week and you don't see them kick somebody, or at least try to kick somebody, I, you're, you're around a carnival horse. Real horses kick. Uh, you, get, you get behind them, irritate them, frighten them, startle them, or maybe just because they're feeling cussed that day, they will kick. And uh, if, if you're There's not no on the expert alert... Counter, counter, uh, countering expert or... or what, 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 what did the record say uh, that was on the other side? Well, they had... Here's... Well... As Did far as the expert, really nothing, expert. because they, they hired an expert. Uh, in fact, my, my, my colleague pointed this out to me because I missed it the first time. They'd hired an expert, but they never provided an opinion for the expert. I don't know why. Trial strategy, I don't know what the, how, that was so, about. So we have, we have an expert opinion uh, that, that is not countered, so it's, it's, right. it's still standing. Right. Uh, and does he ever say... Uh, Negligence caused my client's injury. Yes, probably. Okay, so and that's not that's that's not contested with any testimony on the other side. Uh, is that is that with no expert testimony? No. No expert testimony. No. What about lay testimony? Well, the Wrangler and the Wrangler's boss, and I think another employee, made general statements like, "Well, horses basically basic if you boil it down. Horses are nice. They've never kicked anybody." It's just nonsense, but that's what they said. It's not enough, though, to counteract the, the evidence from the expert. Didn't, didn't the defendant argue that the, the expert was just too speculative, that his, his opinion was entirely too speculative? Right, How they did. How do you did. to that? Well, experts deal with probabilities, good experts, as I mentioned before. And this expert dealt with the probability. This probably wouldn't have happened if you had done the things you were supposed to do. Nobody can tell you who's a valid expert that this certainly wouldn't have happened. And, and, but this is not speculation. This is, just, this is expert testimony. This is based on my 50, 50, 40 to 50 years of experience in handling this sort of thing. This is the situation, and this is what you should probably expect. And this, is, this is why what they did was wrong. Not only wrong, but because they're knowledgeable professional people. This is, their, this is what they do. This, this, this moves into the level of conscious disregard enough to justify the imposition of gross negligence by a jury, which is, of course, one of those things when there's any question at all about gross negligence, just like punitive damages, when there's any question at all, it goes to the jury. Now, they did say, well, you, know, you didn't talk about loss of consortium in your opening brief, but in the order resolving the summary judgment, that never came up. The trial judge never made any ruling about loss of consortium. And they said, well, you didn't talk about punitive damages in your opening brief. Well, there again, the trial judge didn't deal with punitive damages at all in the, in the, uh, in the order that ended this case. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to take up space in an opening brief with stuff that that's, that's, that's just has, doesn't have any relevance at all. So I don't think we waived anything like that. But I do ask the court to take a look at the uh, index of record 30, Exhibit C. Uh, it, this is a textbook example of how not to write a release. I don't know what the person was thinking when they wrote this. I mean, it's like they're out to lunch. Maybe they were copying a form and just left off a few words. I have no idea how this happened, but it's not a release. Uh, if I may reserve my time. May. Thank you, Your Honor. Counsel. 
Thank you, Your Honors. My name is Jenna Mandracia from the Grasso Law Firm, and I represent Wild Western Horseback Adventures in this case. And I think Your Honor made a wonderful uh, uh, point, and that is that the very first sentence of the plaintiff's response brief to Wild, West, Wild Western's motion for summary judgment was, it should be denied because Arizona's equine statute does not apply to this case because the claims against Wild Western horseback are for gross negligence, not ordinary negligence. That's what was represented to the lower court. And then also on page but, 11. But stop. Did, did you seek summary judgment specifically on negligent, on the negligence claim? We absolutely did under the equine statute. Where? But the, under the equine statute. Okay. But what if we do, what if we conclude the equine statute does not apply? If the if the equine statute does not apply, we still submit that the court properly denied um, any claim for negligence and gross negligence. On the same ground. Now you submit. But did you submit? Did you argue that back then? We, well, we submitted that the claims were barred under the equine statute and also that they did not fulfill um, their obligations or meet the standard to meet gross negligence. Okay. So, no. You I, argued only under the equine statute. Well, we have, yeah, motion for summary judgment under the equine statute and also um, under the gross negligence standard, which would have also addressed each one of the elements of negligence. So I believe it's all encompassing. Okay, so by challenging gross negligence, you're challenging all lesser offenses. Is what you're Essentially, saying. yes. And also, in, uh, on page 11 of the Groover's brief was the claims fall outside of the waiver because the claims against Wild Western have always been for gross negligence. In the response to uh, the defendant's statement of facts, it repeatedly said that the waiver does not matter because these are not um, negligence claims that have been raised against Wild Western. So in, in, in essence, um, based on those representations in the lower court, they spent a substantial portion of the opening brief and also the reply focused on application of the equine statute, whether it's a purported release, whether or not um, there were certain, uh, certain elements that were satisfied. And we absolutely- How does this have anything to do with the equine statute? The case? No, the release. The release has, brings it within the equine statute. It triggers really? the protections. I believe so. And looking at the equine statute itself and the legislature's intent, I feel and we submit that this case falls firmly within the equine statute's protections. So, so what did your client ask them to release? So if because we Because I read it and I don't see what they release. So I believe that and we submit that the actual release itself has all of the elements that are required for a release under the statute. They, Ms. Groover assumed full responsibility for any injury to herself. She acknowledged. No, isn't there an except there? There is. It says. Yeah, it's a big except, yeah. isn't it? It says, except to the extent such damage or injury may be due to the negligence of, of our client, okay. of Wild Western. And, and there was no and, negligence. But no, I mean, at best you argued there was no gross negligence below. That, well, your, your motion says they can't meet the gross negligence standard. You don't say in your motion they can't meet the negligence standard. I grant you, you said we move on all claims. But then the second sentence, since we're talking about sentences in briefs and opening briefs, plaintiff's claims fail as a matter of law because they cannot meet the gross negligence standard. Correct. And I've looked through your brief just quickly. That's the only thing you talk about is the gross negligence standard. Right, because it was our position and Wild Western's positions that the negligence claims were barred and they're immunized pursuant to the equine statute. And if so, that fails? And then if that fails. It was error, right? The Superior Court heard. The Superior Court did not, no. We believe that, and also, it also reflects in the Superior Court's order. The court took it a step further. 
One, the court found that the equine statute did apply, that the waiver and release was valid, which triggered the protection of the equine statute. Then the court took it a step further and also said that giving all deference to the proponent of the avert claim or defense, meaning plaintiffs, reasonable people could not agree with the conclusion of the plaintiff and that the court found no reasonable assertion of any facts that can lead to a conclusion that the defendant was negligent. So let's follow this through. Let's say we conclude the court was wrong in applying the equine statute. We find the release didn't trigger it. It doesn't apply. Then we're back to a standard motion for summary judgment in which the motion was limited to gross negligence. It did not move beyond or this gross negligence standard. And we're back to is there any fact or reason that a reasonable person could hook into to say that, yes, this should go to a jury. So tell me why he's wrong that their expert didn't at least produce a question of fact sufficient to go back to the jury on both negligence and gross negligence. So expert affidavits, if they are based on inadmissible evidence, conjecture, require speculation, that's not sufficient to defeat a motion for summary judgment. Now, if we were required or if we're looking at Mr. Johnson's affidavit and the opinions he renders therein, it would require anybody looking at his representations to speculate as to what because. Walk through that for me. Sure, absolutely. First and foremost, there is no evidence whatsoever in the record that of what caused this horse to kick. Right. He takes issue with the one to six Wrangler issue. And again, there's no published peer reviewed article. There's no standard. He essentially concedes that. Can you argue all this to the jury? Couldn't we? Well, it would require the jury to speculate that if there were in the event there weren't one to six Wrangler issue, even if there was a Wrangler for each rider, that doesn't mean that that would have prevented the horse from kicking. It would require the jury to speculate. So I'm not even sure you need expert testimony on this. But but to the extent that rule 702 specifically contemplates experience based testimony. I mean, how you're talking about an unchallenged expert with 40 to 50 years of experience handling horses. Why isn't he entitled to opine on what he thinks probably happened or probably shouldn't have happened or probably what if certain steps would have been taken, the accident wouldn't have happened because it's not that you're calling that speculation. But how? What? Show me some case law where. Sure. There's several cases that are on this particular pick particular issue. But at the same time, there needs to be facts that support those opinions. And the opinions that are advanced are not supported by the record. The fact is that to assume the facts facts are where the horses weren't properly spaced. Fact is that the Wrangler had not turned around and looked at the at the line for some period of time. I mean, was not did not what was know what was going on behind him. Fact is, there should have been a Wrangler in the back again, according to the expert. I'm just like I'm putting under facts out there in the light most favorable. I'm not saying this is a winner. I'm saying in the light most favorable to the plaintiff. Why don't these easily line up for a jury question? Well, understood, Your Honor. And you make a good point. But the fact of the matter is, is they're not supported by facts. It's not the facts. It's not supported by facts that the Wrangler was not looking back the line. There's there's nothing in the record to support that. I thought the Wrangler himself testified saying he didn't remember the last time he had looked back. He didn't. But he also testified that he was he looked back at the line for most the ride. And he situates himself such that he can look back at the line. And we know he didn't look back at the time this happened because he can't tell us what happened. We know that he did not witness that the horse. So we know that we know that a fact the jury can consider. Well, that would that would also require the jury to speculate that that was a cause of the horse. This is like televised. And there's like comic to it. I don't if I was the expert. So, Judge, you know, and I and I'm not a horse expert and I came up with that. You know what? I think you'd have a better argument. 
But the word speculation is relative. Uh, if you have a, a physician in a specialty who thinks the problem is this, that's different from me as a, as a judge saying, I think the problem is this. This is a, a wrangler with 40 years of experience who, right, he, he wasn't televised and he doesn't have it uh, annotated, uh, but he, he, he learned facts. They were told to him, right, like people go to Dude Ranch, buy, and he opined uh, that, that, that there was a connection between the two. Why isn't that sufficient? The connection between the two is so far removed and not fact-based, there is no evidence as me, to what the hor what caused that horse to kick. And okay, that is- let's, let's take a place where, let's add a couple of additional facts that we know. Um, the, the Dude Ranch, um, Wild Western, had planned to have two riders that day. And if they had had two riders, there would have been one at the back and one at the front. And we would know. And the expert says, they should have had two riders. Isn't it a natural inference to be drawn from that? The Wild Western knew that too. And if Wild Western had done that, at a minimum, we'd know what happened. And that's something that gets to the jury. The only notation in the record that there were supposed to be two Wranglers on that ride was from testimony based from Mr. Groover. And that is inadmissible hearsay, not supported from any other uh, testimony from other than Mr. Gruber, and that was not the case. Okay. And all of our witnesses testified as that that was not a requirement. Having only if there were young children on a ride would they have two Wranglers. There were no young children on this ride. And even if there was a Wrangler right so, at the back. Don't we have a dispute now? We've got an expert who said you should add two. And you got your people saying, no, we really didn't need to. Yeah, I mean, this is all great stuff for the jury. We're, we're the Court of Appeals. Because I think what the point is, is that Mr. Johnson is making assertions that aren't supported by any facts. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but what do you want an expert to do? Are you saying he's got to go out and, and have surveys proving that on anything more than six, other companies take it? He said that. That's evidence. So what fact is it that you say he doesn't have? Well, he's what relying that? he's relying on the fact that there was supposed to be another Wrangler there that day, and that's based on Mr. Groover's he testimony. Than that? He says he thinks he says the industry standard is to have two, not just that they were supposed to, but that. And and I'll, I'll let me just take and I and I, I truthfully don't know where the source of it is. I just knew it was it was in the record somewhere. But if we take as true that nobody was planned to be a second writer that day. He still says, look, the standard is to have to, and they should have known that, and they should have had to. Well, Your Honor, he also says that the standard is, is that everybody's su supposed to wear a helmet, but does that have any causal link to the actual injury that was sustained here? No. If everybody was supposed to wear a helmet, and there was a breach of that standard, does that have anything to do or causally link to a horse kicking Miss Groover's leg? No. And that's the same with all of the other breaches of uh, care that he opines that are not based on actual facts in the record or supported that, let's see, the one to six ratio, that does not mean that that would have prevented a horse from kicking Miss Groover's leg. Also, he failed to adequately monitor the line. That's not based on any fact in the record. In fact, it's contrary to it. And that doesn't mean that he could have turned back and prevented that horse from kicking Miss Groover. In fact, she said it happened so fast, and no one knows what happened but in that sense. doesn't the evidence show that they were dragging behind? The horses were separated by too much. You may disagree with it, but they said that they were, they were separated, right? At there's some, testimony at that point. Too. At some point in the ride, but there's been no testimony that that was the actual instance right before that horse kicked. In fact, Miss Horse, Miss, excuse me, Miss Groover testified that her horse had stopped to urinate, and that was the reason why it had stopped. You, you move for summary judgment? Did I? Your client moved for summary. We judgment. did. Yes. Okay. Yes. Keep going. So that may have been whatever caused us. Uh, the horse to pass. 
that doesn't that doesn't support mr johnson statement that it was due to a huge gap that was due to some type of negligence or gross negligence on behalf of the wrangler that's not supported so isn't an inference so a jury can draw that if there had been the second wrangler behind them that that second wrangler could have at least observed and if there was action your point is they can't prove it part of why they can't prove it is because there wasn't a second wrangler back there to say what happened and the first wrangler wasn't looking to tell us isn't that what the jury gets to sort out that because you can't use the fact that let's say you didn't send any wrangler out well nobody can say what happened so i guess we're not negligent isn't that the argument that you're essentially making it's it's not the well i think the if there was an additional wrangler in the back again that's not necessarily a standard we don't agree with it it's not supported and also it is requiring a jury to speculate that that would have made some type of difference and there's nothing to support that that could have stopped a horse that was in front of an additional wrangler from kicking that their animals so tell me if this is right the wrangler said it was important to monitor the horses quote to see if there's inherent risk that you may see someone overriding a horse kicking on them pulling back on them or having difficulties did he say that he did um that was his testimony that why it's important to look back at the line right now let's go to the second part and did he say quote that he had no understanding of what was going on in the line behind end quote uh and he could not recall the last time he looked he could not because a long time had passed since that particular instance but it's his typical practice and he did testify that he spends most of his time sitting sideways monitoring the back of the line but he also has to pay attention to following the trail as well so why isn't that evidence i'm sorry what okay so he says it's important this is the right he calls it inherent risk that you see someone overriding a horse kicking on them pulling back and then he concedes he had no idea what was happening behind him and he doesn't remember looking back why aren't those i think you've said many times there is not a single fact in the record why aren't those facts that 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 someone could say well there's some negligence or causation here that led to this injury well if the wrangler mr hansen was at the front of the line monitoring the back of the line and the entire line that that still doesn't establish if he had eyes on miss groover in the entire line the whole time that doesn't establish or have any type of bearing that the horse would not have kicked in that split second the horse would not have kicked okay keep keep going sir So overall, when we look at the whole scheme of the equine statute and the legislature's intent, and that was to protect the equine industry and immunize equine owners and people that engage equines in certain activities, they should be protected under certain certain circumstances. We submit that all of the elements of the equine statute equine statute were satisfied in this case. The court properly applied or properly held that the equine statute applied that the waiver was valid and that the groovers claims for negligence were barred um also the court properly held that not even a hint of negligence negligence could be shown therefore there was no way that gross negligence could have been um supported and <clears throat> we ask that this court affirm the lower court's order thank you Counsel? Um, I'll keep my comments brief. Uh, Wild Western did not ask this trial court to make a decision about negligence. It asked the trial court to enforce a gross negligence standard under the statute. The only way you get to the statute is if you've got a proper release. And here we don't have a release. Uh, we've got uh, language that I assume full responsibility for personal injury or for loss or damage except to the extent such damage or injury may be due to the negligence of the company. And it, when it's talking about the company, it's talking about a completely different company. Uh, there is no such company, as far as I could tell, as Red Rock Horseback Adventures, Inc. 
In the briefing, the other side refers to uh, that entity as its legal predecessor, page 12 of the answering brief, and as its predecessor business entity, page 18 of the answering brief. But if you look at the records, and I did, of the Corporation Commission, it's not there. I, I don't, this, this Red Rock Horseback Adventures Inc. apparently never existed, at least not in Arizona. So the long and short of it is, is what, we, we, what we've got here is a Duke Ellington uh, clause, uh, Duke Ellington uh, release. And by that I mean uh, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. And this doesn't have the swing, this at all. This simply, this, this simply does nothing, and it doesn't trigger the statute, so the gross negligence standard does not apply. Uh, I could, of course, talk with you for an hour, because I love talking with you, but I've, I've finished my comments, and if I will, I will start down my time to the court if there's no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you, folks, for the arguments. We are going to take the matter under advisement, and we will issue our decision in due course. We're going to stand at recess now. Thank you, folks, and have a good day.